I've been away from New York for weeks and uh, working remotely, and I have like one pair of pants. <laughs> You know, which is too much information for your listeners. Yeah, but because you're not I, wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> and half the time. Uh. PowerPoints, power lunches, conference calls, reply to all, endless meetings, constant check-ins, and so much wasted time. Are you sick of the BS? So are we. It's time to take our time back, rework the way we work, and make every call a call to action. This is a podcast for people who want to stop talking and really start connecting. This is After 12. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to After 12, 12 for 12's original podcast series that explores cool companies, brands, messages, and makers, and what compels us to take notice and to become fans. Our guest today is my old friend and former deputy mayor of operations for the city of New York, as well as the former commissioner for the Department of Environmental Protection under Mayor Michael Bloomberg. For the last year, he has served as the head of public enterprise at Uncork, a no-code application platform helping large enterprises and organizations build complex custom software. It's a mouthful. But prior to this, he worked for five years with Bloomberg LP as the global head of technical operations. Internet, please put your hands together for a very smart and cool guy, Mr. Kaz Holloway. Kaz, welcome to After 12. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's been, uh, it actually has been great to reconnect. So thanks, Adam. Yeah, likewise. Uh, and congratulations on your one year anniversary at Uncork. Uh, if you told me a year and a half ago that I would be in the software business, I would have looked at you funny, but well, uh, it's been a great year. Well, tell me, so we're living in such a weird time. And I think, you know, in terms of being able to reconnect with you, um, there's really no better time with the global health and economic effects of COVID-19. Uh, the racial anguish and violent protests from this past weekend, um, just the uncertainty in the air, uh, you know, people um, not knowing what's going on with their careers or their governments. Uh, and really, this is the time I pick up the phone and I call my old buddy Kaz Holloway. <laughs> <laughs> How are you and your family faring? How's everybody doing, first off? So... Um, first of all, the fa thank you for asking. Um, the family is great. You know, like every, we have been impacted, I would say in, in the way that, uh, that at most families have, which is just having everybody together all the time. Um, but overall it's been, uh, we have been very lucky, um, certainly compared to, a lot of the impacts that so many families, whether it's on the health side or the economic um, dislocation side. Um, so we've been very lucky. Um, how about you? Yeah, it's, it's the same. It, you know, it's like the silver lining is that I, I've spent more time um, with my kids getting to know who they are. Um, I mean, remembering their names, uh, <laughs> learning about what they like, what they don't like. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, it's, it's, it's been nice for is, um, unprecedented and, and just uncertain as things go, um, to spend time with the family. It's, it's been great. Um, the last time I saw you was at a dinner eight years ago in LA. Um, but I did want to say, I noticed you in a few cameos in the Bloomberg presidential campaign commercials back in February. Managing a crisis is what Mike Bloomberg does. Uh, and I love, I love seeing you in those. And I was like, you worked in various capacities for Bloomberg over the last 12 years, both in on the government side in New York City and at Bloomberg LP. Um, what was it what was it like working for Bloomberg and what what key kind of learnings, takeaways are you now employing in your new your new role? Well, working for Mike Bloomberg uh, and and for, you know, the Bloomberg team as so far the great, you know, professional, um, opportunity of my lifetime, um, and have been able to do a number, so many different things working as part of that team. Um, and Mike himself is just, I mean, probably how he comes across to the world. He has, um, relentless energy, uh, just, in, and really, and he has, uh, from, I don't know, five in the morning until, until one in the morning, 
I, I don't think he stops. Um, and, uh, and he achieves a lot. I mean, a, a tremendous amount. He is a model for, um, you know, somebody who is not wasting a minute, uh, and is trying to help as many people in as many different ways as possible. So we're lucky he's around. Well, it must have worked out because, I mean, that you just described yourself, too. I mean, you are the master workaholic. You probably watch <laughs> five, you sleep maybe five hours a day. And in and, and those five hours, your kids are probably sprawled over you in bed and you're saying, God, this is going to suck tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, uh, you get into a 24 seven mentality. I actually in operations um, and that actually for me started really working um, in the city of New York and it really hasn't stopped. You know, you really just get into a mode where, of course, you're on, right? Yeah. Um, and um, so it, I don't always, I'm not always, have the, I don't have the biggest fan base all the time uh, with family, but uh, but but they're totally used to it. And, um, and you know, we've been very lucky, uh, whether working with Mike, um, both in the city, working for the company, but now in this totally new opportunity, and I will say that uh, what, you know, for, for what may seem, I made a joke about being in the software business. For me, Uncork really was a next natural step um, because it enables something uh, or enables me to kind of work directly on something that was a deep frustration in public life, which is that when disasters like Hurricane Sandy and other things happened, you need a technology response just as much as you need an operations and a human response. And so often the technology response um, is what would be, would cause delay and frustration. Um, sure. And you, you could lose months. And so for me right now, we've had the opportunity to work on some COVID related projects that have enabled us to show exactly what this platform can do. And uh, it's pretty awesome. So for as challenging as these times have been, it also has been an opportunity for my company to work directly on some COVID related things. And for the company as a whole, that's been really rewarding. And, uh, so it's been good. I, you know, I've been thinking about the, just the role that you had in, in the mayor's office and dealing with emergent situations. And, you know, it's crazy how much has happened since then. I mean, like, you know, since the beginning of the year, say Bloomberg dropped out of the election in early March, COVID-19 closed the country shortly after the economy is spiraling. The U S jobless claims are almost at 41 million as unemployment nears 15%. Now we have race riots in major cities across the United States and the world. Um, are we living through one of your deputy mayor stress dreams? And did you happen to touch <laughs> Vigo, the Carpathian's pink slime from Ghostbusters 2? What was will be, what is will be no more. Now is the season of evil. And be honest, because I have hundreds of listeners. <laughs> uh so first I, I, you know, um, there is a, I think first of all, and I see, I've been able to see this, uh, at least on the sidelines in a sideline role for what the city is dealing with and for what New York city and New York state as one of the epicenters of the COVID crisis. Um, I think both the governor and the mayor have done a great job. I am, and I think it is, it is people, that word unprecedented gets thrown around. Yeah. And people will go back and say, yeah, sure. There was the Spanish flu. Um, so it's not technically unprecedented, but really, if you think about, you know, the interconnectedness of the global economy and what, the, you know, what, what, how much impact this has had, it is unprecedented. And I think, um, let me just make a comparison to hurricane Sandy. Uh, that was for the people that it impacted directly uh, an awful trauma. You know, 44 people lost their lives. Tens of thousands of homes were destroyed. Um, and so, but it was still localized, mm -hmm. you know, if in a, in New York city, in New York state and the other, in the other places that were touched by it, some places were devastated. Many others were not. And as soon as the power got back on, people went on with their lives. This has impacted everyone everywhere um, continuously. And for the frontline healthcare workers, for the operations people who are delivering food to the, the food insecure, um, 
people who need pediatric kits and other services. I mean, this has just been, uh, you know, a, a really um, challenging time and hats off really to the, to the teams that I've seen working on this. Well, it's amazing to me. I mean, so for a year you've had this new role working in software and, you know, it's, it's different than public service. It's different than, you know, operations from the perspective of, you know, running large complex systems. You are, you are working with, um, organizations, jurisdictions to try to institute, um, a no code solution alternative to get certain programs up and running. Tell, tell us how Uncork is such an ideal platform right now of all times to mitigate disruption and create opportunities. I mean, you know, you were, you just mentioned the food insecure and, and what the programs that you're working on in New York city. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so we're doing an, um, a number of things in New York city. We're also working with, um, Washington DC and, um, there are a couple of other places that we're hoping to do some work with, but in New York city, the thing I would focus on is the food program. And we, um, you know, were, I got a, a call from the CIO of the city uh, in March and it was a Friday afternoon. And, um, she said, we need to stand up an end to end, um, service for people who are food insecure to number one, tell us, um, if, you know, see if they qualify for food, why they need it. If they need it, they need to be able to order it. And then it needs to be delivered to them. And we need to stand that up by Monday. And, um, and you know, the question was, can we do it? And I said, I think we can. I just need a bag of coca leaves and some co- coffee and we'll be fine. <laughs> exactly. Uh, tell me where it is. I'll take it there myself. Exactly. No, but the, um, but on Monday we actually went live with a, uh, really a front end that could be accessed by anybody on mobile. Um, that was a simple set of questions that the city decided. And then, um, you know, we were able to basically without writing code, you then build behind that a workflow and rules engine that enables you to batch the food orders, send them to a hub, the hub then fulfills the order. And then you have the other side of the equation, which was we had 350,000 TLC drivers. We had to build a portal for them to be able to sign up, sign up for ships, go to one of these hubs, pick up food and deliver it. And we went live on the Monday as, as requested, we delivered 15 meals through the platform on Tuesday. Yesterday, they delivered 700,000 meals just yesterday. So, um, what that's, that's crazy. I mean, I, so I'm in Portland, which is only has 650,000 people. So in New York, you're averaging 700,000 meal deliveries a day. I, it were, they are, I would say the average, we have definitely been above 500,000 a day for, oh, wow. and, and, and I know that the projection is that they will get to a million or more. And that's only on the side where they're ordering and doing deliveries to people who are, who are um, food insecure and unable to leave their homes. There are other programs wow. that the city has where people are able to go grab it, go and pick it up and all of that. But, um, you know, this program is for people who are either immobile, um, they're quarantined, they are. Um, either they have COVID symptoms or they're, or they're not able to help themselves. Um, and you can see it's a, uh, not only can, are we doing it through the mobile app, but you're able to make phone calls. We gave their, their call center the same software. Um, and so w- what I would, um, what, what was interesting about this is then what you need in these emergencies too, is not just the ability to stand that up, but the city Um, is going to be looking to get reimbursed from the federal government for most of this because this food is critical to the survival of citizens. And and so under federal laws like the Stafford Act, you know, these are the circumstances under which the federal government is supposed to provide a backstop and assistance so that it enables cities like New York and others around the country to provide for those basic needs for their citizens. But in order to get that reimbursement, you know, you have to show a lot of things. You have to show who did you feed? Were they qualified? How did you get it to them? How can you prove it? Who took it to them? And when we say that Uncork is a no-code platform built for enterprise, I can tell you for the 16 million meals that have been delivered through the platform, um, who got it, whether they were qualified, when they entered the program, you know, who delivered the food, and then how much they got paid. <laughs> so it's crazy. that's the kind of thing that, you know, from that, that, 
in my experience in Sandy, you know, you still would need rooms full of people filling out worksheets um, and months to develop software to be able to manage that kind of data flow. And um, with a combination of our no, the combination of our no code tools um, and easy, you know, scale using the cloud because we're cloud based, mm -hmm. um, you know, we were able to scale up to meet that need very quickly. Well, I'm sure the jurisdictions are looking for, you know, real time analytics on all this stuff, too. Right. They want reports daily or weekly or monthly kind of thing. Oh, I, I mean, multiple times a day. We do, yeah. So the whole demand snapshot is uh, that the city is using is based on, you know, our platform. And uh, and, you know, I can tell you that 55 percent of the meals that have been um, of the food that has been delivered has been to the Bronx to 15 percent has been to, you know, three specific um, zip codes, which correlates, you know, with socioeconomic needs, certainly. Um, and, you know, it's a, uh, the ability to do that um, and do it quickly has been one of the things that, uh, and it has enabled them to scale and to continue to deliver. So this is every single day, seven days it's a week. Crazy. Kat, Kaz, does this whole thing blow your mind too? Because I mean, you went for, uh, you know, you were, you were telling me about like, you know, getting an opportunity with Uncork and, and knowing the CTO from your your um, days at the the mayor's office, I I just it's crazy that that you know a that a national pandemic has hit. Yes, and maybe this is un, not unprecedented because it, it happened a hundred years ago. But I mean, b the fact that you've only been in the job for you know a year, and to see it actualized in you know, real world world circumstances that you dealt with, you know, again, with Hurricane Sandy or, you know, kind of coming up with post 9-11 regulations and overhauling um, the demolition process after that, that tragic fire at 130 Liberty um, in New York, like on a scale of deputy mayor duties or operation duties, this is kind of like the perfect storm of like why you need something like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, I certainly agree with that. By the way, thanks for uh, you know doing the research. Nobody's brought people haven't brought up the, uh, the demolition work in a long time. Um, but the uh, but it is it is it is it has been an amazing opportunity to be able to participate. You know, and and it did happen very quickly. I will say that um, the it's interesting with software. So our firm started as a firm that was servicing insurance and financial services. And we still do, you know, we serve um, some of the biggest financial services and insurance institutions. You'd know the names, um, Goldman Sachs, Liberty Mutual, those, you know, they're just a couple. Sure. Um, and the work that we do for them is absolutely critical. What's interesting about the criticality of this work is, you know, if the, you know, it, we're talking about the ability for a family that's food insecure to order a meal and have it delivered so that they can eat. Um, for a driver to sign up and work a shift uh, when they're otherwise going to be unemployed so they won't be able to feed their family. Mm -hmm. And I think for our firm, it's just been an amazing opportunity and a learning experience about, um, you know, what it means to serve the public with uh, software on a massive scale, because it's, uh, you know, there is no margin for error. <laughs> Well, and it's great to hear stories about technology for good. You know, oftentimes it's for shareholder value, but if it's for, you know, essential services and the life and health of your family, I mean, I, I, it's again, the fact that it's, it's happened so quickly in your tenure in this position makes me wonder if you actually created the problems, Cass. Did you create COVID? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, We'll we'll get to the bottom of it. This podcast has a lot of money. Don't look it. too deep. Don't look too deep. <laughs> I mean, okay. So I was watching a speech in 2012. You spoke at the uh, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, and I watched all. I think it was like a, an hour of, of you talking very eloquently. But the thing that stood out to me in my in your speech was you said. Um, People only notice operations when something is going wrong. And I, man, it just really resonated with me because it's like so much of life in business and technology is, is the status quo. And when you see that you can make a difference and your technology or your solution or what you're selling, your product is making a difference, that's when you realize um, 
that you're in the right spot, right? And I, and I wonder, is this why you've been able to keep such a low profile for your whole career? Because you're good at your job? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I, it, I hadn't thought of it that way. I will say, I, I make a, there's a joke I make, you know, um, probably too frequently for people who've worked with me, which is, you know, I'll be like, hey, did you guys get your thank you notes this morning? <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, you know, every time, you know, when I move to a new job, they're like, what are you talking about? I didn't get any thank you notes. Right. Like, yeah, no, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, I think that, uh, it is, um, you know, the mark, the mark of good operations is that you, nobody says anything. Um, when I worked at the water, you, you know, when I was running DEP, which is the water and sewer utility for, for New York city, the thing about that is what, people just have an expectation that it's going to come on. They don't have most people. And then really most, I mean, 99% of people have absolutely no idea where this, this, where it comes from or how it gets there. Right, you know, they right. may know that it comes in a pipe. Right, right. But it's coming from 125 miles away for a system that took over 100 years to build. Pretty incredible stuff. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I've always been interested in my career in trying to um, deliver service to people uh, directly, uh, do it better, and try to hit the people who need it most. Um, and this has been another opportunity to do that, which is great. What speaking of which, what are your thoughts on um, the U.S. response to COVID nineteen? I mean, as an operations person, I I can only imagine you've rolled your your eyes a few times. You know, um, I don't. People ask me all the time, "What do I think about this administration?" Or you know, at, at the various levels, and um, I don't really think about that too hard in terms of like. Um, uh, first of all, the, the opportunity that I've, I've had to observe close at hand, um, how the operations for certainly at the local level have been, um, mm -hmm. I've been uniform, you know, it's been, the team is top notch and people are working around the clock and, you know, um, you, you're only as successful as your next operational failure. So I have a lot of humility when it comes to, yes. um, the judging the performance of others, yeah under uh, extreme circumstances like this. I and think I think that, fair. you know, I think most of the people who are running the, uh, the agencies, the operations, the not-for-profit groups, you know, every part of the system has been stressed and strained. Most of the people who are doing those things are just trying every single day to meet a demand that is incredibly intense. So um, I, you know, I, 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 no, I don't have any, anything but good things to say about what I've seen so far. Um, uh, I think it's going to go on for a long time. I think also that the impacts as they unfold, you know, are going to be, um, you know, we have to think about what does this mean long term? Um, what does it, what does it mean? What does a post COVID-19 world look like to you, Cass? Yeah, you know, I've thought, I've thought about that question really from the perspective of delivering critical services that people need. And what I think, uh, it, you know, is that there is going to be coming out of this, what I think about as a virtual imperative, uh, an imperative to create a virtual option for any service that is critical. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we actually have helped New York City to do is virtualize its marriage license process. Starting in mid-March, um, you couldn't get married in the city of New York. Uh, and New York City was issuing more than 250 marriage licenses a day not to mention domestic partnerships and all of the other things. And, um, and that's, you know, that was a process that you had to do in person for a hundred years. Um, you had to go in person, verify your identity and get the license. That just seems and, silly for, for a number of reasons. You know, and by the way, there was part of it that you do online. I want to be, you know, fair to the, yeah. the, 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 the just, but, but you still to, to actually get it done, you had to go in person. It's not the only service, by the way. You have people are standing in line at a buildings department or places all over the country. You know, two forms of ID. Of yeah, 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 yeah. And I think coming out of this, it's not as if those things are going to go away. You're still going to have services that you can go and wait for in a room full of people. But it's not going to be acceptable um, or viable going forward for there not to be a virtual option. Yeah. And by the way, a virtual option can be a lot more cost effective and efficient um, if you do it right. So 
I think that is going to be the challenge. And I think from, from at, up to this point, there's been lots of call, you know, digital transformation is a buzz, you know, as a buzz phrase in sure. the public sector and the private sector. Um, uh, but it always has been fundamentally optional um, to invest in a truly virtual alternative to getting a service that you need. Cause you, in order to get married, you got to have a marriage license. <laughs> um, otherwise it ain't happening. So, and that is true of so many things, um, uh, things even more critical benefits determinations, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of, you know, uh, child welfare case management, um, you, you name it. And so I think that, um, that is going to be a big push coming out of this. I think you'll see legislation on it. Yeah. I mean, you were, when we talked the other day, I mean, you, you said we need a virtual option just in the way that the ADA compliance allows people that have handicap to not have to do certain things that, that seem to be, um, unrealistic requirements. Um, it, it's absolutely, it's I, I, you know what, I think that's a good, um, uh, I, I, I do think that's an apt comparison. I do think that, um, it won't be, you may get, you'll get to a point where in, for certain services, it won't be legal not to have a virtual option. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, uh, not, it turns out not only can it be more efficient and effective, it's also not good for your health <laughs> not to have it. <laughs> right. Um, right. So, so um, now that creates huge opportunity too, which is, which is great. It's funny. The, uh, the, you know, we talk about buzzwords, digital transformation is, is huge. And, and the professional services clients and technology clients I have, we all use that ubiquitously. Um, but it seems like the, the word of the year is now officially pivot. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to ask, I mean, I'm pivoting right now. Cass. No, uh, exactly. I just wonder, you know, how has your, your pivot been from, you know, kind of the, the public sector to um, Bloomberg as a, you know, running technical operations for a huge communications company to now going into this pivot to the sophomore software and technology world. Um, and, and what do you, what do you see that pivot playing out in terms of this post COVID world? Like what kind of things do you have your long-term goals set on in, in terms of leveraging Uncork to do some great things that I, I know you have in your head? Wow. That's a, so I'm going to, I'll unpack that quickly. Um, I, <laughs> we have one minute. <laughs> take out socks and <laughs> take out the socks and the underwear. So um, I, first of all, Bloomberg LP and uh, you know, as I say, um, Mike Bloomberg and, and the Bloomberg, you know, we're company and, and the administration just, you know, I learned so much. I think at Bloomberg LP, I learned a lot about software about software um, development, delivery, uh, about you know, service expectations. Um, and the Bloomberg terminal is, you know, I think that they describe it aptly as the central nervous system for um, global finance. Uh, you know, if the terminal's down, you've got a problem. Um, kind of like water in New York City. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was huge um, and got me thinking, you know, now this this platform to me, it was a unique combination of the right product um, uh, at the right, you know, time. And I thought, you know, I think this could enable me to, to, to do something in an area that I certainly feel passionately about, which isn't to say I'm not a technologist. I feel passionately that um, the loss of uh, time due to the, 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 the developments and cycle time for technology is something that, um, you know, I do feel passionately about um, doing that you absolutely have to have great technology and that it can, you know, enable you to deliver um, services to people who need it uh, much better and faster. Um, so that is something I will say for the bigger picture question, like what do I think um, uh, of the, you know, the, the overall opportunity. Um, I here, here's an interesting thing about government to me. Um, say you're going to open a restaurant. Uh, you, if you try to do that in New York city or anywhere, 
you know, it's going to be a challenging process. You're probably going to have to get in New York City up to 17 permits. You're going to have to get them from the city, the state, the feds. Um, and if you're just trying to open a business, you don't care what level of government or who, you know, or the different, that's up. Sorry, you know, I'm the city. You have to go to the county to get that thing. Right. You, you just, just want, want to get it. And you just want it. You you don't you just want it. And I yeah. think what what a app what a what a platform like Unquirk enables is you to really abstract away all of that back office stuff. And if you can get the levels of government and stakeholders just coordinated enough. Right. They don't all have to have the same system. They don't all have to have the same technology. You know, if they all had a login to our platform and, you know, the right workflow, you can get that all done and really just focus on delivering the service. Um, so to me, that is, you know, a, a promise of what, what our product, but what, what no code and what, you know, this platform can deliver, which is, which is cool. I, I think it, it kind of uh, marries the best part of you too. I mean, Kaz, since I've known you, you've always been uh, a strategic thinker. You're you're thinking the big picture, the long game, but you're also very tactical. You're you're not let's sit here and wait for the thank you cards. Let's go out and do it. Let's make it happen. So kudos to you, man. Um, really happy to to reconnect with you and to talk with you. I guess um, last thoughts, last question. Um, what are you what are you looking forward to? What you know, one of the things that I, I think has been such a uh, a watershed in thinking with regards to being in quarantine is not having certain expectations fulfilled or not being able to look forward to things or or seeing things more more simply. Um like spending time with your family, um, watching Frozen with your 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 kids uh again. What are you looking <laughs> again? What are, <laughs> and again, what are you looking forward to, Cas? What, what <laughs> reenacting Frozen? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Frozen one and two. Perfect. All right, on our next podcast. Yeah, um, man. Uh, I I do think uh, even my own expectations uh, coming out of this about like what what is where where do you need to be to work? You know, I, I it. it you don't need to nearly be, well, you don't certainly don't need to, you don't have to be in an office. I learned that. Um, I think the thing I'm looking forward to the most, honestly, is pizza, like real pizza again. Pizza time. <laughs> like I in, a, have in a pizza parlor. And a pizza place. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, um, I think that, uh, but I do think uh, and this is where, you know, part of the elements of this being it is unprecedented. But on the other hand, you know, there are historical antecedents for this. I think things will many things will return back to normal. Um, and the question is, how do we learn um, and and what are we going to do to ensure that? I mean, the, the you know, the, the, dis- the recovery, the economic recovery from this is going to be, you know, tremendous for, for many, many years. Yeah. The whole generation is now this is going to be their frame of reference. Um, and so I am looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. I love, you know, um, you know, taking part in what, uh, how core, um, you know, the way our, you know, society decides to, you know, how people get the services they need, how how that's going to change a lot. And it's going to be fun to be a part of that. What about consciousness or do you think there'll be a change of, more of a cultural catharsis, um, the way we do things, the way we value things, purpose, meaning, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what do you think? I want, I want to just get that sound by, hmm. <laughs> I'm like a smart one. <laughs> <laughs> next, next to my keyboard. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I Mike, don't know. Mike Bloomberg might have been like, would be like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, know. I don't think like human nature is going to change as a result of this, but I do think that, uh, um, uh, we've already talked a lot, my Jessica and I, uh, you know, we need, we don't need nearly as much crap as we thought. Yeah. Have you know, like I've been up, I've been away from New York for weeks and, uh, working remotely. And I have like one pair of pants, <laughs> you know,
know, which is too much information for your listeners. Yeah, but, because you're not like, wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> and half the time. Uh. What about, Kaz, do you think you'll ever make that transition back into a public profile? I mean, as an old friend, I've always thought, when is Kaz Holloway going to run for president? Because that's, that's a vote <laughs> I will make. Oh, man. Adam, thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I have always had my sights uh, si- uh, focused on the local level. I love local service delivery, you know, like, and that's why New York City has just been amazing. Um, you know, the higher up you get in government, the more abstracted away from actually delivering a service and seeing the, you know, the outcome is. Um, sure. You know, but uh, um, so I have known have any specific, nothing specific in mind, except I do know, I do want there to be, you know, I've had two chapters in public life. My first job out of college was working for the Parks Commissioner in New York City, which was awesome. You know, an amazing. Um, and that's, that's, that's when you brought you two to the, the park, right? Well, that, no, that was the goal. Oh, that was we, that was the goal. That's we we cold fire. called them. We <laughs> okay. cold called you two, and they okay. they didn't come. We did get Garth Brooks, um, which was like the last big concert in '97. Uh, but the um, I had to throw that in. But the um, uh, and then I, you know, then pr- private sector, and then back into the Bloomberg administration. There's definitely going to be another chapter um, in in public life. Uh, I have no idea what it is. Um, uh, but. It will, because, you know, that's what is, to me, it's very motivating. Um, And it's the best people I've ever worked with. You know, government, um, sometimes government workers get a bad rap. I find that they're, you know, among the most talented, skilled, dedicated that I've ever worked with. And um, thank God, by the way, because a lot of the work, getting back to your operations point, is thankless. Yeah, (laughs) especially now, I'm sure. Well, listen, Kaz, it has been a total pleasure catching up with you. Um, congratulations again on a year at Uncork. Uh, good luck with the future. I know it's going to be bright. And if you ever need somebody to shoot your campaign commercial, I have an eight millimeter camera that I've had since we were in high school. It's got your name you on it. You got it. Oh, man. Well, I, done. Done. Absolutely. You got it. <laughs> Adam, thank you so much. Kaz, it's been great talking with you. 